tonight, a sigh of relief from millions. The Bank of Canada cuts the interest rate. We've come a long way in the fight against inflation. What it means for your mortgage. So I got caught up in the variable interest rate nightmare. And the financial road ahead. Surgeries on hold at an Ontario Children's Hospital after the deaths of two patients. Also, what police are saying and what the government isn't on foreign interference. Who are they? No government is going to discuss intelligence information. And liftoff of Starliner and Atlas V. Plus, blasting off a giant leap for Starliner and Canada's space program. That was the capsule communicator for the first launch. And one of their own in the Stanley Cup final. Somebody from small town Imperial winning the Stanley Cup, that would be really cool. The coach that has Oilers fever sweeping through a Saskatchewan town. Go, 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 go. CTV National News with Omar Sachadina. Good evening, everyone. There are finally signs of a major turning point in the fight against inflation tonight after Canada's central bank became the first in the G7 today to cut rates. Wearing pins in support of Canada's top hockey team heading to the Stanley Cup final, the Bank of Canada's number one and number two gave Canadians another reason to celebrate today, saying if the bank continues to track closer to its 2% inflation goal, it's reasonable to expect further rate cuts. CTV's Adrian Gobriel on the first drop in years and what it might mean for your mortgage. 16 months of soaring interest rates have pushed many Canadians to the brink. I got caught up in the variable interest rate nightmare where it kept on going up and up and up. The Bank of Canada signaling today that we may have finally started our descent from the painful peak. The Governing Council decided monetary policy no longer needs to be as restrictive and lowered the policy rate by 25 basis points. Which brings the Bank of Canada's key interest rate to 4.75, down from 5% where it had been sitting since July of last year. The bank began raising rates in March of 2022, following larger than expected inflation numbers. The central bank is now predicting a soft landing for the economy, while also keeping a cap on inflation. Our various measures of underlying inflation, you know, since the start of the year, they've all been moving in the right direction. It is reasonable to expect further cuts in our policy rate. For millions of Canadians facing mortgage renewal, the rate cuts simply can't come fast enough. My mortgage is unfortunately up for renewal on July 17th of this year. I'm looking at possibly having to sell my house because uh, because of the payments. For each decrease of 25 basis points, floating variable rate mortgage holders can expect to save around 15 bucks for every $100,000 on their mortgage. Historically, banks are quick to bump their prime rate higher in tandem with the Bank of Canada. They've been less eager to do so on the way down. Though when rates were lowered four years ago, the banks followed within a day. If you're on a variable rate mortgage, I think you will see your rate come down quite quickly. I think the banks and credit unions and other lenders will, will react to this. Governor Tiff Macklem is clear to point out that when it comes to future rate decisions, they'll be made one meeting at a time. The central bank's next interest rate announcement is set for July 24th. Adrian Gobriel, CTV News, Toronto. One of Canada's biggest children's hospitals has paused surgeries after two patients died. Joining us now is CTV's Heather Wright and Heather McMaster Children's Hospital in Hamilton, Ontario has launched a review. But what do we know so far? Omar, we don't have a whole lot of information about these two deaths. We know one of the patients passed away in May, the other earlier this month. And while the hospital says there is no apparent connection between these two cases, they have paused all scheduled tonsil and adenoid procedures until an external investigation is complete. The hospital has not released the cause of death for the two children, but say one passed away the day after surgery, the other nine days after their initial procedure. Removing the tonsils and adenoids, which are lymph nodes in the back of the throat and nose, are relatively common procedures and are most often performed in children. They require general anesthesia and are usually brief, generally taking between 30 and 40 minutes. In a statement, the hospital said, our deepest condolences go out to these families for their tragic loss. 
The hospital says it is in the process of telling patients that their scheduled surgeries are going to be postponed. They will continue to do emergency surgeries during this pause, but at this time it's not clear how long this external investigation may take. Omar. All right, Heather, thanks. A high-speed police chase involving a stolen truck near Winnipeg ended with one man dead. Their cruiser was ran by the stolen vehicle. Officers immediately engaged the suspects, resulting in a use of force incident involving the officers discharging their firearms. A passenger was hit and died of his injuries. Three other suspects, including the driver, are now in custody. The police cruiser was riddled with bullets. Manitoba's police watchdog is investigating since officers were involved in the shooting. And gunfire erupted outside the U.S. Embassy in Beirut today. <laughs> An armed suspect was arrested after a shootout that lasted 30 minutes. The State Department says he was wearing what appeared to be ISIS insignia and that embassy staff were not harmed. Mounting calls from the opposition today to release the names of parliamentarians accused of working on behalf of foreign state actors in an explosive report this week. CTV's Mike LeCouture on the clash in the Commons and the RCMP's response. A cloud of suspicion hung over Parliament Hill as a bombshell intelligence report accused some Canadian politicians of wittingly working for foreign state actors. Canadians have a right to know who and what is the information. Who are they? Despite being grilled throughout question period, the government remained tight-lipped. Mr. Speaker, uh, the leader of the opposition knows very well that no government, including the government of which he was a member, is going to discuss particularities of intelligence information publicly, so he knows better than that. The chair of the National Security and Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians defending the decision not to name names, adding they were as transparent as possible. It is up to the RCMP to decide on the basis of any intelligence or evidence they may have in their possession whether they're going to take steps or not. By not releasing names, parliamentarians in both houses continue to face questions. How concerned are you about that type of thing? In 2020, the Senate ethics officer said Conservative Senator Victor O oh breached the code of conduct for accepting a free trip to China. Senator O oh also defended Chinese community centers in Canada, some of which have been suspected of being clandestine state police stations. Canada is always first thing in my heart and I look forward to carry on whatever the time I have is always loyal to Canada. In a statement to CTV News, the RCMP said it is investigating foreign interference in Canada, but will not comment on whether or not there is an active criminal investigation into any parliamentarian. Omar. All right, Mike, thanks. Millions of Americans are feeling the heat, sweltering in record-breaking temperatures. It was 48 degrees Celsius in Death Valley, California, with the heat dome extending to Nevada, Arizona, and Texas. And summer doesn't even officially start for a couple more weeks. Those records aren't just in the U.S. Today, the EU's climate service revealed the world has now marked one full year of back-to-back -back monthly heat records. And as temperatures go up, so can the cost of cooling your home, if you can afford it in the first place. CTV's Genevieve Beauchemin breaks down the numbers. Another muggy day in Montreal. When cranking up the AC is less luxury, more necessity, and that's more and more frequent with increasingly hot summers. There are, and it's on now and I'm not even home because I don't want to die when I walk in that house after. And I don't care what it costs in electricity, I want to be cool. But many Canadians are doing without. In 2023, 26% of homes had no cooling equipment. And that proportion is highest among those in the lowest income bracket. A program in BC funds free portable units for those in need. The program will provide over 28,000 air conditioning units to people across the province. But energy prices too have those struggling to make ends meet feeling the heat. The costs vary from province to province. In B.C., it's around $20 a month for central air. But that's if the dial is set at 25 degrees Celsius. Still, those selling home cooling devices say business is brisk. Sales have shot up here over the past three years. Right now, we're in the second wave of heat of this year already, and people are already saying, no, it's enough. I need an AC like yesterday. 
Energy efficient heat pumps are growing in popularity. And utilities like Hydro Quebec say there are also other ways to maximize cooling efficiency, including drawing blinds. And also, if you use a ceiling fan uh, in, uh, as well as an air conditioner, uh, you can actually reduce the temperature by one or two degrees. And those tips may come in handy with forecasts of another hot, humid summer in many parts of this country. Geneviève Beauchemin, CTV News, Montreal. And this time of year also brings the threat of wildfires, fires that come with a devastating emotional toll, but also a financial one. CTV's Paul Hollingsworth on what families are discovering about how their savings are getting scorched long after their homes have burned down. Overcoming the devastation has felt insurmountable for families still reeling from Nova Scotia's 2023 wildfire season. 200 buildings and 151 homes were destroyed. It's still ongoing. We're still displaced. Renee Hines' family home in the Tantalan area of suburban Halifax burned to the ground. Even with insurance, Hines says the experience has been financially devastating. We have dipped into our savings. There there's more bad news. Hines new home, when finished, will have a higher assessed value, which means a property tax increase. Either double or triple. And like over a 10 year span alone, we would be spending almost twice as much as what, you know, our neighbors who thankfully did not lose their home. The organization that oversees property assessments told CTV they can't offer any help to Heinz. The Property Valuation Services Corporation does not have the legislative authority to create property tax policy, set property tax rates, collect property taxes, or provide property tax relief. Financial planner John Macy says property taxes are growing at almost twice the rate of inflation. Heinz and others in similar situations could be forced to extend their mortgages longer with lower monthly payments. So you've got to make adjustments and you know one way unfortunately to do that is to extend the runway on the debt. In addition to the financial pressures, it's also taking a long time to return to a sense of normalcy. Renee Hines' new home will not be finished until December. We never asked to have all these expenses and we certainly never asked to have our property tax double and triple. Hines simply wishes she could have her old home back. The longer this process drags on, the more expensive and stressful it becomes for her entire family. Paul Hollingsworth, CTV News, Upper Tantalan, Nova Scotia. A giant sinkhole has swallowed the tip of a beach on the world's largest sandy island. Take a look at the land slipping away on Gary Island in Queensland, Australia. Campers have been asked to stay away. Near-shore landslides like these are common at the UNESCO World Heritage Site. And while Australians were looking down, many others were looking to the sky. Boeing Starliner space capsule is expected to dock at the International Space Station tomorrow morning after years of delays and glitches. CTV's Kathy Lee on the significance of the mission and the Canadian who played a part in making history. And liftoff of Starliner and Atlas V. A landmark liftoff. Boeing successfully launching its first crewed flight test aboard the Starliner from the Cape Canaveral space station in Florida. The voice of Mission Control speaking to two veteran NASA astronauts, including Canadian Joshua Kutrick. There is certainly a sense of relief and a huge sense of excitement when that rocket cuts off after the, the initial ascent. The journey to the International Space Station will take just over 24 hours, where the astronauts will test the capsule's capabilities. Third time's a charm after two scrubbed missions. LC switch is not ready. Clock stopped at T minus three minutes, 50 seconds. I know it's really easy to lose patience uh, as you're waiting for um, launches to happen. I hope you agree with me that today's launch was definitely worth waiting for. Good SRB, the success of the Starliner's launch takes it a step closer to certification for future exploration to compete with SpaceX. All this innovation takes us up to the International Space Station right now, but that's just the short term. Really, we're trying to get back to the moon. We're trying to get to Mars and uh, and move out into our solar system. Next year, Kutrick and three others are slated to go to space for six months. Very much looking forward to, to taking the mission uh, next year on this very same spacecraft. The Starliner is expected to return from the ISS after 10 days and land in the United States. Kathy Lee, CTV News, Calgary. Coming up, commemorations on the eve of D-Day. The next day they weren't there, you know. 
honoring the bravery and sacrifice of the Regina Rifles. Plus, why one tiny town is all in on the Edmonton Oilers. The Princess Royal hailed the bravery today of a key Canadian regiment to storm Juneau Beach 80 years ago. Soldiers from Saskatchewan, whose service and sacrifice will now be honoured for generations to come. Here's CTV's Joy Malbin in Normandy, France tonight. Princess Anne as Honorary Colonel-in-Chief to the Royal Regina Rifles, unveiling a statue of a rifleman charging into battle. Depicting the Canadians who fought the Nazis, the Rifles, among the first to storm Juneau Beach, suffering some of the heaviest losses. The statue unveiled today will forever help tell the story of loyalty, of bravery and of duty of the Johns. Using their nickname Farmer Johns, the rifles pushed further inland than any other regiment to dislodge the Nazis. Bill Siffried says bullets were falling like rain in Normandy. Ask me to go and find out how many we lost. And I, at our little group, we lost 25. Well, they had to get 25 new ones. So that was quite a shock. Do you remember your friends? Well, there's a lot of friends the next day that weren't there, you know. It's... Capturing that sacrifice, this eight-foot bronze statue, and everyone wants to know about that look on his face. The unknown determination of a young man uh, sent to, to do a job, he would have a lot of fear and um, we wanted to show that it wasn't just a picnic. Many were farmers, prairie boys, and 20% of the regiment were indigenous soldiers. 458 of them did not make it home. Their exploits on and after D-Day are, are legendary. Uh, they made the, the greatest incursion inland on that awful day, uh, when, when there was so much uh, death and, and carnage uh, on the beaches of the Channel. Uh, it, it, was, it was sad, it was traumatic, it was heroic. And now a lasting reminder of that defiant determination on the very beaches where Canadians made a stand. 80 years after D-Day, keeping their legacy alive for generations to come. Joy Malbin, CTV News, Normandy, France. And just across the English Channel, the King paid tribute to D-Day veterans. It is a near impossible task to imagine the emotion of that day. The pride of being part of so great an enterprise. Charles made a rare public appearance since his cancer diagnosis. He was joined by his wife, Queen Camilla, Prince William, and the British Prime Minister at a port on England's south coast, from where Allied troops set sail 80 years ago. And we will have special coverage tomorrow. D-Day Remembered, the 80th anniversary from France, begins at 8 a.m. Eastern on CTV News Channel. Still ahead, a salute to veterans who have a hundred reasons to celebrate. When you reach a hundred years, chances are you've surmounted a few hurdles and know what it takes to live. Today, a special celebration for that exclusive group, mostly veterans who shared their secrets to a long life with CTV's Annie Bergeron-Oliver. They call them Century Club members, and every year the Pearly Seniors and Veterans Health Center holds a special party just for its 100-year-old residents. That's a milestone that, um, you know, we, we stand in awe of, right? Whenever somebody arrives at that point in a long life, it's, uh, there's no better time to have a great celebration. <laughs> Today, the center celebrated 14 residents who are all over 100. Nine of them are military veterans. Well, I don't think there was any secret. Just one day at a time and enjoy life. In 
101-year-old Roland Lalonde enlisted in the Army at age 20, and in August 1944, he landed on the Italian coast. My Army life was just like any other Army life. I, I served in Italy with the Royal 22nd Regiment, of course, and uh, I participated in the liberation of Holland. Did they give you a Purple Heart in, Hol in Holland? In Holland? Yeah. Guy Talevi's 102-year-old father, Oreo, also served. He was injured while fighting in Holland. I'm happy that, uh, that he volunteered to go over there. Um, and uh, that uh, he was able to make a contribution. Stories of bravery, hard work and compassion spanning more than 10 decades. Their secrets to making the milestone birthday? Never give up. Exercise. <laughs> Walking while I play golf a lot. Annie Bergeron Oliver, CTV News, Ottawa. A well deserved party. After the break, the small town Canadian coach on a quest to make hockey history. The Edmonton Oilers' unexpected journey to the Stanley Cup final mirrors that of the team's head coach, whose own career path wasn't straightforward. Growing up in a small Saskatchewan town, he always dreamed big, and now a community is rooting for him to reach his goal. Here's CTV's Allison Bamford. This is when Chris played with the Alberta Golden Bears. Long before standing behind the bench in NHL arenas, Chris Knobloch spent most of his time at his hometown rink in Imperial, Saskatchewan. He'd be on the ice here from 9 in the morning till 8 at night. That's been there over 20 years. Throughout the old barn, constant reminders that the Edmonton Oilers head coach got his start here. His dream was get to get to the NHL, and uh, yeah, he's finally made it. Knobloch coached in the American Hockey League before moving up to the NHL ranks just seven months ago, joining an Oilers organization that at the time ranked second last in the standings. I had sent Chris a text when he got called up that said, you got a long ways to get him out of the basement, but I know you can do it. <laughs> and he's done it. And once that dream became a reality, literal signs popped up proving the southern Saskatchewan town is now oil country. My mom's a pretty big fan, so that kind of makes me one too. Knowing somebody from small town Imperial winning the Stanley Cup, that would be really cool. Because in a town of 370, if one of their own makes it to the Stanley Cup final, it's something to cheer about. Go Knobloch, you go chance that will no doubt get louder if the Oilers hoist the cup and Knobloch can bring it back home to Saskatchewan. Allison Bamford, CTV News, Imperial, Saskatchewan. Fingers crossed. That's a snapshot of this Wednesday for all of us at CTV National News. Thank you for watching and good night.